Well, thank you. Can you hear me? I am, I am really delighted to be here. And uh, when the invitation was extended, I, I got really excited. I love coming up on campus. I love being around students. And I'm grateful for the time that we have to spend together today. Um, interestingly, uh, he talked about 1985. 1885. 1885. Um, so Provo has been a city, anybody know how many years? 166 years. It started on the banks of, uh, of the Provo River and Utah Lake with uh, what was called Fort Utah. And 166 years ago, I personally believe at that time of creation, there was a spark of entrepreneurism uh, in Provo uh, that has lasted till today. But at the same time, uh, it's a spark that has not always been bright. Uh, I want to talk about 1985 for just a minute when, when we were students here. Uh, that is me. Anyone tell where that's taken? Some of you frequent this spot probably every day. This is the King Henry parking lot. Uh, one of the things you'll notice that's interesting is there's actually empty parking stalls. <laughs> Back there, we, I had uh, five roommates, six with myself. Two of us had cars. How many of you now have cars that, that live in King Henry, right? Everybody has a car and a boat and a trailer and motorcycles and everything else. But that was uh, what it was like. So what else was it like? In 1984, I bought my first laptop computer. It was a TRS-80, 64K of memory. I was actually embarrassed to take it into class because nobody had one. And I kept it in my car and didn't bring it into class because it would have been so awkward. Uh, but I was working full time and I actually was the territory representative for the Citizen Watch Company and I would call on jewelry stores around the state and I'd walk in and it's hard to get this in context. It was about that thick right there. It ran on eight AA batteries. Uh, and uh, there was, that's the screen up there that you can see. I would take it into jewelry stores and I'd set it on the counter and I'd turn it on and I would say the computer says that you should order blah, 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 blah. And they would say, okay because nobody had seen a computer. And if the computer said that, it must be so. And uh, the bar has changed a little bit, hasn't it? Uh, this picture right here was what typical co-working space looked like uh, back in 1985. I rented a small little office after I graduated. I wanted to be an entrepreneur. I rented a little office and the, the makeup of offices were 100 or 200 square feet and they were in a hallway with closed doors and no windows and you would never dare interact with anybody else in the building. It was just a very, very different uh, situation and not highly fruitful for entrepreneurs. As a matter of fact, I find myself extremely jealous uh, of what you have uh, from a culture and an environment. Also back in 1985, if you wanted a job, you almost had to leave the state without exception. There were very, very few jobs uh, here in the state. It's different uh, than today, isn't it? So what happened between 1985 and 2015? A big, hairy explosion. Um, and it's different, isn't it? Uh, let me just highlight a couple of things that I think are, are pretty fun and exciting. Isn't this amazing? Do you like to watch Shark Tank? Um, I don't know that all of these are Provo. They're Utah County, most of them companies. Clearly Provo and Utah County has a totally disproportionate number of representation on the Shark Tank. It's amazing how often you turn on that show and see somebody from this area right here on Shark Tank. Have you been to downtown Provo? Did anybody, raise your hand if you went to the Cascade concert. Isn't that awesome? So this next one, I, this is just one of my favorite, favorite videos right here. Um, I just took this on my iPhone during the concert. Tell me this is your paradigm of Provo. <sighs> I was, I was on a rooftop and uh, taking that picture with some people that hadn't been to downtown Provo and they just kept saying over and over again, this is Provo, this is Provo. This other one was a, a professionally done video uh, of the night.
So any of you that were there, did you fear for your life at any point? I, there's one hand right there. I, I, had, I was backstage, and so I watched that front line when the, where the first people were up against watching that concert, and we were literally pulling people out of there one at a time, and they would stumble off to the first aid station, and we would revive them, and then they'd go to the back, and then we'd pull the next line off all night long. It was crazy. I think they stopped four times to try to get the crowd to push back. So that's Provo. Uh, Camp 4, have you been to Camp 4? Uh, Camp 4 is one of our first co-working spaces that we had here in the city. It's amazing. They have uh, um, Dev Mountain, uh, a lot of events down there. Have you been to Million Cups? If you haven't been to Million Cups, every Wednesday at 9 a.m., it's a group of people, like-minded entrepreneurs that get together, and they have two companies present their company. And then the group casually talks about it, gives them suggestions, uh, feedback uh, on their company. It's really pretty amazing. Uh, nothing like that uh, ever existed uh, back in 1985. So you could ask the question, what makes Provo so special? Why is it this, this, this amazing bed of entrepreneurism? Why um, so much enthusiasm and so much uh, excitement here? And we believe that if you go back, remember 166 years, Provo is the place to start. And think about this for a minute. How many people start their mission here? How many people start their education here? How many people start their family here? I was taught over at the hospital today, do you know we have every year 4,500 babies born in that hospital? More than any other hospital uh, in the United States. Uh, it's amazing. Uh, so it's where, you start, it's where you had your first romance, where you had your first 5K, where you had your first band, where you started your education, your first idea, your first business, your first hike, your first skiing, your first spiritual experience. Many people feel that way about Provo. It's where you start things. And in many ways, I think that's where this juice and this excitement comes from. Well, why? Why is this important to us as a city and as a mayor? Why is it important to me? Think about how often you hear cities' efforts to recruit businesses into their city. And we go out as elected officials and the governor goes out and we try to lure people to come into our city to, to move their business here. And that's fine uh, and it's okay, but it's kind of a win-lose game, right? You, you, another city loses and you win or you compete against Orem or you compete against Spanish Fork. But think about what happens when a Qualtrics starts in a basement of a garage and then expands and grows to the point that a Qualtrics is at today being a unicorn company. How good is that for a city? Isn't that just like eight million times better than recruiting a company into your city, giving them incentives to come in, giving away tax dollars uh, to come into our city? That is why the Provo City is so focused on entrepreneurs is because we believe and I believe but that is the way to build a city, to build economic development, to build jobs. Just look at that one street that we have with Qualtrics, uh, my family, and uh, Vivint. How many jobs, how much good has come into our economy because of those little three startup companies. It's really amazing, and that's why it's important. So how did we do it? How does Provo become nationally recognized? Do any of you watch Fox Business News or Fox uh, News in the morning? When they do their weather report, next time you watch the, the national news, not the business, but the national news in the morning, they show a weather map of the United States. And they have Boston, and they have LA, and they have Seattle, and sometimes they have Denver. And guess what? <coughs> Provo uh, is on their map. How did that happen? How does Provo get recognized that way? I want to give you four things to share with you that I think are important uh, irregardless of whether you are an elected official, an entrepreneur, or go to work for somebody else. They all apply uh, in everything that you do every day. And the first one is you must have a vision. So when I was elected, it's been six years ago, do you know that the city didn't ever articulate what it wanted to be in 20 years? There was no map, there was no vision of what we wanted to look like in 20 years. So the very first thing we did is we sat down and we decided, what do we want to look like in 20 years? And guess what part of it was? Part of it was a community that loved and flourished for entrepreneurs. We want that and we embrace that. So you've got to have a vision. 
You've got to have fun. Are you having fun in your education? Do you get the feeling we have fun in Provo? Can I share a couple of examples with you? So um, here's just some pictures we took right here. But um, so our birthday in the city is, is uh, well, this is a trivia question. What day is Provo City's birthday? Anybody? Anybody? Who's Googling it right now? What is it? April 1st. Right? It's April 1st. So what do you do for if, if your birthday is April 1st? So we decided we were going to have a week-long celebration. And for it was our 166th birthday, we invited the entire city to celebrate. Did any of you go to a birthday party? None of you were here? We had parties all over the city, and then we made this little video to celebrate all of those parties. I want to share it with you. So you get the feeling how important fun is. Um, we want to have fun because if we have fun, you want to have your business here, you want to have your family here. And uh, wherever I've worked, if it wasn't fun, it just didn't last and it didn't, it didn't work. That last little song, so you had the main video and then you had that last little song. I went to 24 parties that week. One of my last parties, it was this BYU student little apartment. And I walked around in their backyard and these guys were, were waiting for me there. They had written that song uh, just, just for me for that birthday party. And it infused me with so much energy. It was really exciting. So you've got to have fun. All right. You must be creative. I had a business partner. Uh, before I, I did what I'm doing now, we actually uh, had a business that manufactured shooting ranges. That's kind of unique and different. We built shooting ranges all over the, the world. And he used to always say to me, I was the sales piece of it, and he was the engineer piece of it. And I would come back and I would say, this other company is doing this. We have to do this. And he would inevitably look at me and say, why would you want to do what the other company is doing? Let's think of something that leapfrogs frogs them and goes beyond what they're doing, and then they have to catch up with you. And it just was really, really good advice. And being creative is really fun uh, and important. Let me give you an example here that I want to share with you. Uh, in this video. So how many of you have been to a city's state of the city address to hear your mayor talk about the state of the city? Really, I'm impressed. Some of you have it. Was it boring? 
Yeah, <laughs> he says it was boring, right? Thumbs up was not meaning it was good, it means it was boring, right? So I have, a, I have a team back there and we were wrestling with this problem. Actually by city law, I have to do a state of the city address, which means I get up in front of the council and we invite people to come and for an hour I talk about how the city's doing. And it just never goes like, it's fine. I mean, I don't, it's not bad, but it's never exciting. So our team got together and they said, well, we've got this fun idea we want you to try. So this was the state of the city address I'm gonna play for you uh, that we did leading up to the state of the city address. We did it over at Newskin. And when they announced that I was on, I was not there. And this is what the people saw uh, that came to hear the state of the city address. Over the past year, Provo has made itself known as a fast-growing, great place to live, where top rankings from nationwide magazines and newspapers to back it up. To bring us all up to date on Provo's progress, Mayor John Curtis will be giving the State of the City address to a packed house at the New Skin Village this morning at 10 a.m. Is that better than the state of city address you saw? <laughs> yeah. so, um, so by the way, um, in the introduction, they talked about me getting credit for certain things. And so this is a really good example where this makes me look really good. And behind me, there's this amazing team. But I, I never complain about taking the credit for things. And it's because I get blamed for every bad thing that happens in the city. So I feel like it's only fair uh, that I take credit uh, for things like this. But this is, to me, was just a really good example of thinking outside the box. How do we communicate the message? So you saw during that all the accomplishments we wanted to highlight uh, that had happened the year before when we, when we bought Rock Canyon, preserved Rock Canyon. Uh, you saw all the national rankings that we got. Isn't that a far better way to present it than me to stand up and say, you know, this year we bought Rock Canyon and, and it gets boring, boring. The other thing then, is we were able to take and put this online. So instead of the 100 people that were there to see it, thousands of people were able to see it because we put it online and make it accessible online. And uh, it was pretty fun. It was a fun project to be involved in. So the next thing, the third thing is you've got to think big. I think one of the best things I get to do as mayor is I get to walk into a room of really hardworking people and say to them, you're not thinking big enough. And uh, it's easy for me to say, right? But it happens all the time. How many of you have been to our recreation center? Is that not amazing? Do you know the Provo City Recreation Center is the highest gross revenue receiving recreation center in the United States? 
We, uh, when we built that, we were subsidizing the old one. I don't know how many of you have been to the old one. It was an old swimming pool at Provo High School. We were subsidizing that $800,000 a year. We now subsidize the rec center, zero dollars. Um, and it's because we thought big. We didn't want to build what everybody else had built. We wanted to, to build it bigger. And a couple of examples of that, um, I'll share this. It's okay to share these videos. You can tell we love videos over at the city. I've got a great team there. So thinking big, remember this. Uh, this in Can you hear that? So um, when I was elected as, uh, as mayor six years ago, the paper had an editorial and it said that I Provo was a millstone around our neck. Now, if you don't know what I Provo is, if you're, if you're new to the area, uh, a number of years ago, the city started a fiber network called I Provo and it was a disaster. We, we spent um, 40 to $60 million on it and uh, it was losing money. And the paper called it a millstone around our neck. And uh, fortunately, because I was with a group of people that thought big, we sat down in a room and said, how are we going to solve this problem? We're going to get Google Fiber to come buy that from us. Um, and that was audacious. That was who would believe that Provo City could be a Google Fiber city. And we started out on that track really believing that we could go get Google Fiber uh, to our city. And I remember very clearly the first day we got them to visit our city. And they told us that if anybody found out that they had been to visit our city, they would not pursue the deal. So we took them to a hotel room over at the Marriott, and we all snuck in there. And we, all, we didn't get to take them around the city. They didn't want to see the city because they didn't want to be seen here. And I had uh, a, a computer set up, and all we could do was show them things on that computer. And we convinced them that there was magic in the air here in Provo and that this was a special place. And several months later, we got to announce that Google Fiber uh, was coming to our city. It was a really, really cool thing. But those things don't happen unless you dare dream, unless you dare think big, that amazing things can happen. And uh, it's been my experience, when you dream them, guess what, you can make them happen. Another uh, uh, thing that we talked about just a minute ago, uh, some people would have considered this the single biggest problem we had in the city at, at one point too. Do you know that Rock Canyon, I don't know how many of you go up there, it's beautiful. If you haven't taken a date up there, go up there immediately. She'll fall in love with you. It's, it's amazingly beautiful. This was all owned by a private individual. And he told us that he was going to mine all these rocks out of that canyon and use them for landscape rocks um, and ruin the canyon. And uh, we, we had to think big and eventually we were able to buy that from him and secure that for the city. So for, forever and ever, that will now be in its natural state uh, as a beautiful place to be. So the fourth thing is that perception matters. Um, how many of you remember what the Provo City logo looked like four years ago? Good, I'm glad you have all forgotten it. Uh, <laughs> that is the Provo City logo. Does anybody see a problem uh, with that? Um, that was our logo four years ago. And uh, we undertook a, a rebranding process in the city. And I knew in my gut that we were going to do big things and that we were going to be looked at nationally. 
that the rest of the nation and the rest of the world would be looking at Provo. And what did we want them to see when they looked at us? And that's what, that's what they would have seen. And if you'd have seen our website, it was, it was similar to that. And so we started out on a process of branding our city and deciding what we wanted our city to be known for. Uh, how many of you re uh, have, remember the Provo Rocks t-shirts? Do you have a Provo Rocks t-shirt? Yeah, amazing campaign. Our new logo, Welcome Home, has been amazingly uh, well received. And uh, it's interesting, branding is a very, very difficult thing. For those of you that will have an opportunity to brand, you'll find that nobody likes what you're proposing. Um, they just don't. I had 118,000 critics of changing that old logo who said we shouldn't change the old logo. Every single resident thought it was a bad idea. But you've got to plow forward because now when people stop and they look at the city of Provo, this is what they see instead of, of, uh, of that. What was interesting is, um, does this have a, a little laser? It doesn't. So the, the logo we call the bug up there with the mountains was what was people fought me on the very most. And they didn't like that at all. And uh, you know it's successful because two years later we decided to redo that flag that you saw there. And uh, if you do flags, one of the things you learn is you don't put your logo on a flag. That's people's first reaction is, well, let's just put our logo on the flag. But think about it for a minute. I bet you've never thought of this. United States flag, all the, all the flags of all the countries are not their logos. They're symbolic of something else. And so we tried to come up with a flag that was symbolic, stripes or all the different things. And those 118,000 residents pushed back and said, no, we want the logo on the flag because we like it so much. So we put the logo on the flag. Um, and that's where, that's where it ended up. So I'd like to kind of switch gears for just a little bit now. We have roughly a 10 or a few more minutes left and, and talk a little bit more about my personal journey. Uh, that's the city's journey and that's how where we, where we got to where we are today. And I hope, uh, before I switch gears, I hope you appreciate uh, how much the city um, is dependent on you and on BYU and um, how important it is that you feel engaged in our city. When I was elected six years ago, you know what the single biggest question people asked me was? When are you going to make downtown a place that we like to go? About somewhere along the line, I stopped hearing that question. We love you to come downtown, and you come downtown in large numbers now, which makes us uh, really proud as a city, and so we need you engaged. So let me switch gears a little bit and tell you a little bit more about a personal journey of mine started um, here at Brigham Young University. And, uh, and we'll see where this goes. So in 1985, I was studying uh, here at Brigham Young University and uh, made the mistake of falling in love with somebody up in Salt Lake. And she was my uh, high school sweetheart. Our first date was a junior prom at Skyline High School. Anybody from Skyline? Yeah, go Eagles, right? Um, and... Uh, so I was trying to commute uh, back and forth, and I'd served an LDS mission to Taiwan and had just a fabulous experience over there. Any Taiwan? Any Mandarin speakers? Don't do what I did. Keep studying it. I've let mine go too far. Now I'm trying to get it back. But it's a pretty cool language. So uh, when I left on my mission, uh, guess what my mother and everybody said to me? Don't worry about what you're going to do when you come back. Go serve a mission and work hard, and that will take care of itself. So guess what my mother said to me the day I came back from my mission? What are you going to do now? <laughs> and she expected me to have all of those answers, um, and I didn't have any one of them. So I started in, started studying uh, business, which was my interest, and a very interesting thing happened. Um, I was uh, approached by an uncle who said, I have an opportunity for you. Um, I'm not going to tell you what it is, but would you come over to my house so I can tell you about it? Does that sound a little bit like a red flag to any of you? So I went over to his house, and how many of you know what Amway is? He, he wanted me to sell Amway, and I was not interested, but very interestingly, there was another gentleman there that was there to hear his pitch about Amway, and he said to me, so you're just back from an LDS mission? And I said, yes. And he said, well, that's really interesting because I'm kind of interested in the church. Would you tell me about it? I'd been home for my mission like 30 days or something like this. And I started salivating and, and uh, 
Those of you that speak Mandarin know that it's very, very difficult to communicate in Mandarin your true feelings because it's, it's just hard to learn that language. And my whole mission, I had wondered what it was like to teach the gospel in English. So here's somebody asking me to come teach the gospel to him in English. And so um, I said I'd be happy to. I went to his home and I taught him the first discussion. I walked out of his house in Sandy, Utah, and I said, I think what I'm supposed to do is get, get the, the members involved. Now, I served a mission in Taiwan in 1979. We didn't have very good member participation um, and didn't use members the way that, that we'd been taught to use them. So I looked around his neighborhood and totally at random knocked on a door. And I said, hi, I'm John. I'm teaching your neighbor the discussions. There's not a lot of places in the world you could do that, but I felt comfortable doing that in Sandy, Utah. Well, as it turns out, I had knocked on the door of the 70s leader. Now, you won't know what that means, but, but years ago, the 70s leader was the ward mission leader. So it was the equivalent of the ward mission leader. I had knocked on his door, and I said, I'd, I'd like some help te 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 teaching your neighbor the, the discussions. So he was excited. He and I started to teach the discussions, and eventually that gentleman was baptized, and then the, the, the neighbor whose door I had knocked on said, well, what are you doing? Would you like a job? And I said, well, sure, I'd love a job. I was seriously, true story. I came back from my mission and needed a job, so I started sweeping the parking lot. Uh, the, the company's now gone. It's torn down. It was on University Avenue. I would show up every day, and he'd give me a broom, and I'd sweep his parking lot for probably $3. I don't know, probably $3 an hour or something. So he offered me a job. And my job was to ride around the state of Utah, and he was a territory representative for the Citizen Watch Company, and he also carried a jewelry line. And my job was to ride around the state, go and see if people needed more watches and more gold and diamonds. And I thought I'd died and gone to heaven. And I did this while I was going to school full time, and I loved it. And it led to, uh, eventually, he had to resign half of the job. He kept the jewelry line, had to resign the watch side. So at age 22, I became the territory representative for the Citizen Watch Company while I was going to BYU full time. I traveled six states selling watches to jewelry stores, and I thought I'd, I thought I'd died and gone to heaven. And um, that actually led uh, to my next job, which was the O.C. Tanner Company. And the reason I tell you the story is that it doesn't work this way for everybody, but for me, um, going on a mission, and serving and then just following the path that unfolded before me is actually how I got here to be mayor. And by, through one step and then the next door opened and the next door opened and I never knew before what door was gonna open or where I was going to go but all of a sudden the door opened for me and I found myself doing the next thing and then moving back to Utah and then running for mayor and that's how I find myself uh, before you today. And like I say, it doesn't work that way for everybody, but for me, uh, just having the, the confidence and the trust and the faith that if I did what was right and lived the, the kind of life that was expected of me, that things would open up. Now I'm confronted with a serious problem because those things always happen naturally, and now I have a term that expires in two years, and every day I wake up and I say to myself, what am I going to do next? And part of me screams inside of me to say, well, all you have to do is wait, and a door will open up. And part of me screams and says, I've got to know more than that. That's not good enough for me. <laughs> I've never had a hard deadline coming to the end of one of these things. And uh, so I'm going through that process right now about, well, what's next for me? And uh, I think if things go the way they have for me, that at some point a door will open up, and I'll know what I'm supposed to go do, and I'll do it. Um, and if it doesn't? I'll come teach at BYU. <laughs> um, there are a couple things here I, I, uh, I saved. I'm looking up the clock. We've got about 10 minutes or two minutes. It's nine minutes. Um, I kind of, this presentation went a couple different directions. And I spent some time on this. And I, let me just share this with you maybe as, as the last thing uh, before I go here. Um, this is what I call the Curtis Regret Chart. It's famous, I'm sure if you Google it, you'll find it uh, out there someplace, right? Because I created it over the weekend. Um, my mission president taught me this one sentence, and it's right here. For all the sad words of tongue or pen, the saddest are these, 
it might have been. And um, one of the reasons I want to share this with you is there are a few things in my life when I look back and say, what if I would have done this? Um, and one of them is, is actually a career decision that I made that I still look back and say, what if? What would have happened? When I decided to run for mayor, this is what drove me more than anything. Because I got it in my head that, it, that I should run, but it was very, very, very intimidating. Think about this for a little bit. You announce to the world that you have no political experience, that you have no background in running a city, and that you want to be the mayor of this city. And then you go through a process of public interviews, a series of public interviews for over a year. And then you, you go to debates and you debate and people talk about in the paper whether they liked what you said or didn't like what you say. And then the day of the election comes and all your neighbors and all your friends go to a poll and they vote on whether or not they like you. And the next day it's published in the newspaper. <laughs> right? Is that not a little bit like, I'm not sure I want to do this? But this is what drove me. What might have been. And I kept asking myself, if I don't run the rest of my life, I will ask myself that question about what might have been had I run. And that's actually what drove me despite all of that uncomfortableness. And the reason I share this with you today is you notice, I think that there's a, a direct correlation between age and degree of difficulty. You will reach a, a time in your life when you can't take risks. You've got young children and you have a wife and you have a family and now I have to, and then you move into paying for college educations, and it gets harder and harder to take that risk. And many of you are at that stage in your life where you're, where you're way down here. And if you're thinking about being an entrepreneur, I'm not here to say it's good or bad for you. It's different for everybody. Um, but it will never get easier. And my big regret goes right back to about this spot right here where I followed one door instead of another, right? And who's to say that, that one was good and one was bad? I just have lots of questions about what if. Um, this, this quote actually came from a famous poem. And the poem was about a, a young lady who meets, um, I believe, a judge in a town. And she says to herself, I've always wanted to marry a judge. Man, I'd love to marry this guy. And the judge says to me, I've always wanted to marry a pretty girl. I'd love to marry this girl. And then they walk away and go marry different people and spend the rest of their life asking this question it, about what might have been. So my final thought for you today is, first of all, thank you for in inviting me here. But uh, ponder that and, and ponder what might have been if you don't, if you don't make some decisions and follow the spirit. Uh, see what doors open up. And for me, it's worked. Thank you very much. It's been great being with you today.